Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the campus of Baylor University here in Waco, Texas, and to today's announcement about the Global Flourishing Study. It's a five-year, $43.4 million research project that will break new ground as it applies scientific rigor to measure the factors by which people and societies flourish throughout the world. At Baylor, this is the largest funded research project in the university's history. So it is a historic day here at Baylor. And it's a major landmark in Baylor's pursuit of preeminence as a Christian research university. Today, we are delighted to hear from faculty members and researchers with Baylor University and with Harvard University, as well as our partner organizations, Gallup and the Center for Open Science. As you might imagine, given the scope of the Global Flourishing Study, uh, which is uh, involving 240,000 individuals across 22 countries, joint support from a consortium of funders was needed to make the Global Flourishing Study financially viable. And that includes support from the John Templeton Foundation, the Templeton Religion Trust, the Templeton World Charity Foundation, the Fetzer Institute, the Paul Foster Family Foundation, the Wellbeing for Planet Earth Foundation, Wellbeing Trust, and the David and Carol Myers Foundation. We are deeply grateful for each one and their support of the Global Flourishing Study. Also, we would like to welcome those of you who are with us in person today as you concluded the Baylor Symposium on Faith and culture, which is presented by the Baylor Institute for Faith and Learning on our campus. Each year, the conference addresses significant issues from the vantage point of uh, Christian intellectual traditions. And so we are pleased you are here to learn more and to celebrate with us the Global Flourishing Study. We also are honored to have with us today Baylor University's 15th president. And so will you please help me welcome Baylor University President, Dr. Linda Livingstone. Thank you, Lori, I appreciate that. It is wonderful to have all of you with us. And as I think about uh, this historic day, I, uh, I, I don't know that there's actually the right superlatives to say how elated we are for Dr. Byron Johnson, for Dr. Vanderweel, for this partnership on this uh, global flourishing study. Um, you know, our focus on research here at Baylor, our Christian mission, and our commitment to facing global challenges and trying to find solutions for those global challenges makes this global flourishing study a natural fit for what we do here at Baylor. And as most of you know, we are in the midst of a strategic plan called Illuminate that is about us becoming among the top research universities in the country while ensuring the integrity of our Christian mission. One of the four pillars of that strategic plan is to enhance the impact, the, the breadth and the depth of the research that we do on this campus. And then we have five signature academic initiatives within that strategic plan, one of which is human flourishing, leadership, and ethics. So this study fits perfectly into the work we're doing more broadly at the university to advance research and to really think about how do we help the human condition for people, for communities, uh, for nations more significantly. So we're thrilled to be able to support this project. And as much as we love the big number, the 43 million, and how significant that is, uh, certainly in the life of Baylor and in research just broadly, there are other aspects of this study that I think will have even far more significant because of its scope and its breadth. Uh, it's global in nature, over 250,000 people around the world over five years in a longitudinal study, which will be the first of its kind in that way. The scope and magnitude are tremendous, which will also allow our researchers, because of the nature of study, to look at causal factors and not just correlational factors, and that's huge and very different than past studies. Uh, we believe that data from this study will reshape the global conversation on what it means to flourish and will provide scientific data that researchers really around the world can use in a wide variety of fields that will really help build our knowledge and understanding uh, in this important area. 
And as exciting as all of that is, as a faith-based university, we also are really excited uh, that this study is going to actually examine the role of faith in human flourishing around the world. And it's going to do it across faith traditions, and not just the Christian faith, but much more broadly in other world religions as well. Again, it will be a first in that regard and will really help us understand how faith impacts human flourishing all over the world. Um, so we are really glad that this study has gotten the attention that it has and that it's going to have the rigor scientifically that it has so it can really have a huge impact on practice around the world. I also want to thank the many, many funders that Lori just read to you that have partnered together to make this happen and to bring about this historic day where we're making this announcement. And again, I want to uh, congratulate Dr. Johnson, Dr. Vanderweel for your work. I know it's a lot of work to get to this point and you've been working on this for several years together. Uh, what a phenomenal grant, what a tremendous opportunity to impact the world in such a positive, positive way. So we look forward to learning from your research, to seeing the impact that it has and to continuing to support that work that you're doing in the years ahead. So thank you all for being here and uh, we're so excited about what's ahead with this study. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Livingstone. And we are now pleased to hear from Baylor University and Harvard University researchers, as well as from representatives with Gallup and the Center for Open Science. And so would you please welcome now Project Director Dr. Byron Johnson. He is Distinguished Professor of the Social Sciences here at Baylor and Founder and Director of the Institute for Studies of Religion. Dr. Johnson. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Dr. Livingstone, for those kind words. You know, you may be asking, how in the world did this happen? And Tyler and I ask that question a lot. How did this happen? Um, and it began with a meeting sponsored by the John Templeton Foundation at Harvard University about three years ago, almost to the day. They brought together a number of scholars from different fields uh, and disciplines to talk about the potential role of religion in human flourishing. Uh, it was a, a three-day event, which was really inspiring and educational, but I remember at the event, Tyler and I would have conversations during breaks over dinner. And we began to ask the question, is it possible to do something that we really haven't done before? Is it possible that we could do something globally, uh, cross-country, that we could do um, with a big end size that we haven't had the, the ability to do before that would allow us to cover different religious traditions because most of the research is in the West and most specifically here in the U.S. and it's mainly on Christian samples. Could we move the needle on all of those things? And as we were talking about it, we both thought, no, it can't be done. It, it's just really not possible to do it. Technologically, it isn't possible, and who would have enough money to fund such a thing? But we thought, would it hurt to ask? And so we began having a conversation with our colleagues at the Gallup organization about this, and we began having conversations with our friends at the Templeton Foundation about this. They too thought we were both nuts to even have the conversation, but we did begin the conversation. And um, as we began that conversation, it seemed as if there might be a way in which we could actually do this, but there was no way to do it if we didn't have on board the funders to do something like this. And so, uh, Lori mentioned the, the incredible foundations that have backed up our efforts. Um, it's truly an amazing thing. So if I had one word today that I would like to share with you, it's gratitude. It's gratitude that so many people have really gone the extra mile to make this happen. And you see that list of foundations on your screen, led by the three Templeton philanthropies that have really undergirded this. And not only that, they have helped bring other foundations to the table in an unprecedented way so that we could, in fact, do something that has never really been done before. So we're enormously appreciative. I think of Sir John Templeton. I had the pleasure of meeting him on many occasions where he said, we really are behind in our, the knowledge that we need to understand religion, and science can help us understand religion, and we need to dramatically accelerate what we know. 
And in many ways, this is a project that will help us do just that. So we are very excited today uh, at the launch of this project. And I'd like to ask Joe Daly from the Gallup organization to come up and give you some information about how in the world technically you could even do such a thing. Joe. Thank you, Byron. Um, my name is Joe Daly. I'm a senior partner with Gallup. Um, I just first wanted to start out by saying um, how excited Gallup is to be partnering with Baylor University, Harvard, and the Center for Open Science on a, a project of this magnitude and importance. Um, Byron and Tyler have been relentless in the pursuit of making today a reality. I want everybody in this room to know that. Um, they, they really, there's been a lot of moments when they could have quit over the last two years and said this, this isn't going to happen, but they didn't. So thank you. Um, and Baylor University, thank you because I know that your support, you've been overwhelmingly supportive of making this, this happen. So um, Gallup is an organization that's been around for 80 years. Our founder had a, a really cool original mission and purpose, which is just to study people and understand what a good life looked like. And so he just ran, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of surveys in the United States. And 15 years ago, we embarked on what was a very innovative thing, which we said, we're going to take his, his mission of just studying the human condition, and we're going to take it global. And so we built some, something called the Gallup World Poll. It's been, been in existence for 15 years. It's covered over 98% of the world's population, and we like to think that it's kind of given a voice um, to, to, those, to those people that have really never had their opinion asked of them, or, or nobody who's studied just, just kind of what's going on in their life. And we've had unbelievable breakthroughs over that 15-year time period just from the world poll, from understanding well-being better to what a good job looks like to how people experience uh, and relate with their government. And if I were just review the 15 years and say, what are two things that might be missing? Number one is we have not been able to go deep on the concept of spirituality and religion and how it ties to really, you know, really important outcomes, overall outcomes for people's lives. And the second um, is that our work is largely cross-sectional, which means that we're looking at people at a point in time, and then we're asking them you know, a, a lot of important questions, and then we can study what the correlations are. Um, with this project, it is a massive, in, in my opinion, innovation uh, for, for global survey research because we're going to build longitudinal panels, which means we're going to go recruit the same people into a large-scale panel over, over 10,000 per country in, in, the, in the study, and then we're going to follow them over a, a five to 10-year period. So we're actually going to be able to start to see you know, what is driving what, which is, that, uh, which is the causation conundrum or, that you might say in survey research that we're, we're, we're aiming to tackle. So that's why I'm really excited. There's two really key elements to doing this. One is to build the panel. You have to go to 22 countries. You have to go knock on doors. You have to go give everybody in the country an equal chance of being selected into the study. So that's literally face-to-face -face enumeration, going, going down and, and, and getting people to participate in the study. Um, the second, and, and we went through a, through a pretty impressive process of selecting our 22 countries that are in this study. We wanted to make sure we had every major religion in the world accounted for. We wanted to make sure we were in every major region and that we had a lot of different cultural and linguistic differences. So we can truly say that we're representing half of the world's population with this study. The second part that gets a lot of times glossed over is making sure that the questions that we ask are the right ones. And you're going to hear from Tyler on exactly what, that, uh, what this questionnaire, what this study is going to cover. But I just want to touch on the fact that for the past year, we've actually been going you know, into the field and we've been talking to respondents in every one of these countries to make sure that the way that we're asking the question is well understood, that the questions we're asking are relevant to their lives, and, 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 uh, and that we're measuring these concepts in a way that is going to be very, very accurate. And there are not a lot of research or survey um, efforts that exist that have gone to the depth of, of, of study and making sure we get these questions right uh, from the start. So in summary, I'll just say that this is incredibly exciting and innovative for us. And, and we really do think at Gallup it could, it could change the way we understand life on Earth. Thanks. And then uh, am I introducing Tyler? Tyler, you're coming up. Uh, Tyler Vanderbilt is coming up uh, to tell you guys about what we're actually studying. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm uh, Tyler Vanderweel, uh, Loeb Professor of Epidemiology at the School of Public Health at Harvard and Director of the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University. And it truly is a pleasure to be here today to celebrate the launch of the Global Flourishing Study. So what is it that we are going to measure? We went through an extensive multi-stage survey development process. We began with a core set of demographic, well-being, and religion questions. We then asked experts in diverse disciplines to provide the best possible questions on topics ranging from gratitude to social connectedness to spirituality. We then asked scholars around the world to comment on the set of questions we had compiled. Subsequent to that, we tried to address some of the translational and cross-cultural comparison challenges. We then opened the survey for feedback around the world. Anyone who wanted to contribute, we had 170 pages of comments from over 130 scholars and participants, which helped us to refine the survey further. We then spent months working with Gallup to address issues of translation, cognitive testing, piloting, to bring us to the set of questions we will, in fact, be using in this study. Concerning well-being, we'll be looking at multiple domains of human life, ranging from happiness and life satisfaction to physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, close social relationships, and financial and material stability. Embedded within the survey will be 12 questions in each of these six domains that form a flourishing index that we've been using extensively at Harvard in various settings ranging from workplaces to educational settings, clinical contexts, and numerous other settings uh, as well. However, our well-being assessment will not be restricted to these 12 questions. We will have numerous other well-being questions, along with various questions concerning demographics, social and economic characteristics, questions on religion and spirituality, on health, on character, on personality, family and childhood experiences, social and national political contexts. And so we'll be able to use this data um, to address questions concerning the key determinants of human flourishing. Questions such as, how is it that religion or childhood experiences or family life or community or work or politics or economics or character affect human flourishing? And how might this vary by country and by context? Critically, to do so, we truly need longitudinal data, data on the same group of these 240,000 individuals over time. Cross-sectional data is not adequate to address these questions. To see this, for example, we've known for a long time that marriage and happiness are correlated. But is that because marriage contributes to happiness? Or is that because happy people are more likely to go on to get married? With cross-sectional data, we cannot tell. Likewise, is religious participation associated with lower depression because religious service attendance protects against depression? Or is it because those who become depressed are more likely to withdraw from their religious communities and other forms of community life? There is, in fact, evidence for both. But from cross-sectional data, we again cannot tell. We need this longitudinal data over time. And we'll be able to address these sorts of questions more broadly with multiple aspects of well-being, looking at numerous potential causes and factors that shape well-being in a variety of countries around the world. The Global Flourishing Study will thus fundamentally contribute to our understanding of the societal determinants of flourishing and deeply enrich our knowledge concerning how this might vary across cultural contexts and what might be universal. With that, I will hand things over to David Meller at the Center for Open Science. I can't say how pleased we are at the Center for Open Science to be a partner on this. The Center for Open Science is a mission-driven, nonprofit organization, and we work to promote transparency and increase reproducibility of scientific research. Open Science is going to do a couple of things. It will maximize the credibility of the answers that we're looking to address. Importantly, it's really going to address the, and increase the equity with which discoveries and findings and data would become available. And the open data will help accelerate the process of discovery um, and, the, and protect the value of this huge investment. The open science framework 
is the platform that will all access to this rich data set. This open source registry is going to do a couple of things. It's going to protect sensitive information. It's going to enable rigorous checks to be applied to analyses and data. It will enable new collaborations. And finally, my favorite, it'll, uh, it'll help enable some setting of goalposts before we see the answers to our questions. We'll be able to check our biases. We'll be able to not fall victim to some of the common uh, pitfalls that, that make it all too easy for us to trick ourselves. This pro process of, of using the registry is critical to maximizing the credibility of our findings. Open science means being focused on getting it right. Open science means not being first, necessarily. It means approaching these questions with humility and willingness to have our answers checked and verified by others. And it means that the data that comes from all across the world is really going to be owned and really going to be shared by all of humanity. This is, this is really too big of a moment uh, to go by the status quo, to follow the normal path. Science is a process that's built on being skeptical, on being open, on being humble, and on being very curious. And we have a chance today to really follow those principles, and, and all of our partners are working together to do just that. So thank you very much. We're really quite excited. Thank you. Now, Thank you, David. I appreciate that. And now we're almost at the end of our event. You could maybe go to the next slide. Yes, Gray Matter Group. So, you know, if you are to publish hundreds and indeed thousands of studies as we plan to, um, it would be for naught if you couldn't communicate those findings all across the world. How, how do you disseminate the findings and market the findings? We're not so good at that as scholars. Um, we like to publish the papers, but we need to do much more than publishing. So Gray Matter Group is another gift to us from the Templeton Religion Trust. They will help us in that regard, make sure that the findings are spread far and wide. And then our next slide, I'm trying to remember by heart, but I can't remember. Oh, possibilities. They are truly limitless when you have this much data. And so we have just put a few things up here that people might be interested in studying, but honestly, it, it will never end. And then in terms of the last thing we wanted to leave with you, and that is, what about next steps? What are we thinking about? Uh, what's the timeline? As you've heard, this is a five-year, five-wave study that will take us through 2026. But we have already begun conversations about the next five years, wave six through 10. And so we're fully committed here at Baylor and at Harvard and at Gallup to move this beyond five years to a 10-year, 10 10-wave 10 study um, that will truly keep the ball moving in the direction that we've started. Um, we hope that it could keep going indefinitely, and that would really, truly be an incredible contribution to the world, and we're excited about that possibility. Um, new countries could be entering the study uh, all along the way. We don't have to wait till 2026 or 2027, um, we may be adding new countries as they come along and, and uh, opportunities present themselves for this study to expand and so that we could even represent more of the world's population than just half. So that too is an exciting prospect for us as we look forward, as well as new items that will be emerging in the instrument over time. So it's truly exciting. Um, if you wanna be in touch with us, we're gonna leave you with some uh, contact information so you can follow up with us. Alex Fogelman, who's in the room standing over here, is our, our project manager. Uh, so he's a key point of contact for us. Again, we're so excited uh, today. Uh, as we were saying earlier, it's kind of like we've won the Super Bowl, so we're going to you know, celebrate today, and then tomorrow we get right back to work. And um, so I think we're going to transition back to Lori. Thank you, Dr. Johnson and, and Tyler and Joe and, and David. Uh, we're also glad to have with us today Baylor University Provost Dr. Nancy Brickhouse. Dr. Brickhouse, if you want to go ahead and step forward with Tyler and with Byron, uh, they're going to uh, have a conversation uh, for just a few minutes before we wrap up our event so we can learn a little bit more about the Global Flourishing Study, its, uh, its impact, its goals, and its next steps. So let's turn it over, Dr. Nancy Brickhouse. Great. Thank you very much. 
I am so excited about this project, but the scale of it is a hard to get your head around at times. Putting this together, can you say a little bit about, you know, the obstacles that you had to overcome in order to get here? What were some of the key yeah. pieces well, that I'll, had to come I'll together? I'll take the first stab at that, Tyler. Um, you know, it just required thinking outside the box. Um, we, we knew that there would need to be a lot of partners. And um, so we knew in that respect we would have to have a lot of meetings. And then, you know, the pandemic didn't help us. Um, of course not. It didn't help um, very many people, actually. So actually, I was visiting Tyler in Oxford for a meeting, a planning meeting. He was on sabbatical in Oxford, and then the pandemic hit. And so we were just trying to figure out if we could get back to the United States. So that was one of the obstacles that we had to overcome. But, um, you know, we've had such great partners. Working with Gallup to try and figure out methodologically how you could even do such a thing, mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen overnight either. As good as they are, it took several months to even figure out if the infrastructure really existed to make it possible. Mm -hmm. And then as Tyler was saying, um, just the effort to build an instrument and to get all the necessary feedback. And, you know, as much as we love Templeton, they put us through the rigors. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they really made us, and, and the project is such a good project because of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it just took, a, you know, round after round after round of revisions to get us to this point. So it's been three years, but it's taken a while. Echoing Byron, I mean, I, I think that the challenges were substantial. I, I'd perhaps point principally to, to two. One was suspending disbelief, which was, um, I think, a challenge throughout the, the, the process. I mean, could, could we really pull this off, both with regard to um, figuring out how to, to work with Gallup to make this possible, but also to raise the, the, the funding, because this is a, an extremely expensive um, uh, undertaking. And, and I think it sort of took the partnership of Byron and I, each supporting one another during times of uh, discouragement and, and, and feeling that this might fall uh, apart um, to, to, to really bring us yeah. to where we are now. Um, and then secondly, and you know, this continues to be uh, a, a challenge, is just when, when you have this incredible opportunity, what is it that you ask? I mean, how do you try to address all of these different um, questions and research topics when you're restricted to, to 70 or 80 or, 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 or 100 items? And the feedback we had um, from throughout the world was, was, was extraordinary. Um, and it, it just created a hunger to do even more. But what we had to keep focused on how do we balance across these different areas of inquiry and these different questions to maximize what we might be able to do uh, with, with this study? Um, so it was a very stimulating but also very challenging part of the process. He so tried I to, to drop out a couple of times, and I wouldn't <laughs> let him. <laughs> and then more than a couple of times, that. I tried to drop out, and he wouldn't <laughs> let me. And uh, we were joking that we would do all these Zoom calls, and as soon as the, the call would end, I would see this area code pop up at Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's Tyler. How did that go? <laughs> um, so uh, it has been a long journey, and I can't imagine doing it uh, with um, a partner better than Tyler and Harvard. So I, th I think the other question I am curious about is related to the issue of the actual survey instrument. What do you think you're going to learn? Oh boy, you want to go first. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we the short answer is a whole lot. <laughs> um, I think. Um, one of the things we'd really like to see, and this will be possible with even the first wave of, of data, is um, how do different aspects of well-being vary across the world? We, we know a lot, thanks to the work of, of Gallup and um, the World Happiness Report, how measures of life satisfaction vary across the globe. But is that different um, for, for meaning and purpose, for for mm -hmm. relationships, for, for, for character, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what are the fundamental determinants of, of these different aspects of well-being? And there's intriguing preliminary data that although measures of happiness and life satisfaction are higher in the developed world than, than the developing world, the, the reverse looks to be the case um, for meaning and purpose. It looks like poor developing oh. countries do, do better in that mm. regard with, with oh. respect to well-being. So what other surprising things might oh. we see? In, 
how then do we reflect on, on mm -hmm. that to, to mm -hmm. try to discern mm -hmm. what, what, what has happened in, in the West? What has happened as countries develop if meaning and purpose is going down and how might we uh, mm -hmm. address it? So, so to be able to do this not just with, with happiness but with, with so many different aspects of well-being really is mm -hmm. uh, exciting. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say to echo something that was mentioned earlier. So often our research has been on Christian samples. Right. And even when we do a, a Gallup uh, survey here in the U.S., we have so few outside of Christianity that we can't do anything meaningful. So for us to be able to tackle important questions mm -hmm. dealing with Hinduism mm -hmm. or Islam mm -hmm. uh, or Judaism is mm -hmm. just, just mm -hmm. remarkable. Jeff Levin, I think, is here in the room, and Jeff is going to crank out he cranks out studies every week, but he's now going to be cranking them out on Israel, on Judaism, and flourishing. And so it's just really exciting that we're not going to overlook Christianity, but it opens up so many opportunities that um, it's kind of breathtaking. So, so one final question, and that is you, you mentioned the first wave of data. So when is that? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll say a little something. We're in the, the process of impaneling right now, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is an enormous undertaking. How do you recruit all these people to mm -hmm. come into the study? So that's going to take a number of months, but we hope, Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're going to actually go into the field after the first of the year um, and begin the actual data collection. And if all goes well, we actually will have data August slash September. Wow. And our first wave of data. And um, so we'll all be teed up, ready mm -hmm. to go to analyze data once we get it. And mm -hmm. again, working with our friends at Center for Open Science, what a huge, huge blessing that is because, you know, again, people mm -hmm. from everywhere will we'll want have to have access to it. To it. Mm -hmm. Tyler, do you have anything Dale said to that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do think one of the strengths of this study is that it will be an open access data resource. Scholars mm -hmm. um, and, and, and journalists and policy makers mm -hmm. around the world will have um, free access mm -hmm. uh, to, to this data. So we really are very excited to be partnering with the Center for Open Science in this regard and, and to seeing not only what the research teams at Baylor and Harvard will learn, um, but what researchers around the world mm -hmm. may discover from the Global Flourishing Study. Thank you so much. I can hardly wait to see what we learn. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brickhouse. Thank you, Byron, Tyler, again, Joe, and David, uh, for sharing the excitement about the Global Flourishing Study. And we look forward to the first wave of studies in the future. For more information on the Global Flourishing Study, uh, Byron shared uh, the websites of the Baylor Institute for Studies of Religion, also the Harvard Human Flourishing Program, uh, Gallup uh, with their analytics and the Center for Open Science, as well as baylor.edu slash research. Additional informational packets, if you would like more information or those on the study, they're available from the Global Flourishing Study team, and I believe Dr. Alex Fogelman uh, can be of help with that. Again, we thank you for those of you who gathered here today in the Baines Room here on the campus of Baylor University and for those who are joining us on the live stream today uh, from throughout the country and throughout the world. We thank you so much for joining us for today's announcement and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>